guys. Hi everyone. Good morning from Indonesia. I hope everyone is uh, excited for another day of Indo Anesthesia. For all participants, I would like to welcome to the 19 Indo Anesthesia 2022. So this is our day three. This is our second week of Indo Anesthesia. As you guys already know, we will run four weeks until the beginning or the first week of March. So stay tuned. And I would like to welcome all participants. I think until this morning, we already have uh, 2,700 registrants. Thank you. Coming from more than uh, nearly 50 countries, I've checked this morning. And a gentle reminder that actually you only need to register once for the whole event. So you don't need to register for every day. You can use the same link. And selamat datang kepada seluruh peserta Indo Anesthesia. Uh, saya mau mengingatkan kepada teman-teman uh, yang sudah mendaftar nanti bisa menggunakan link yang sama, jadi tidak perlu mendaftar lagi karena kami banyak dapat pertanyaan tentang hal itu. Uh, untuk teman-teman yang ingin di Indonesia, jangan lupa Indo Anesthesia ada door prize untuk tiga peserta yang beruntung. Jadi buat mereka yang aktif bertanya, yang mengikuti acara dari pagi sampai sore, stay tune nanti sore jam 6 kita akan ada pengumuman. Okay, so we will start our first session this morning. I think this is uh, something very interesting for everyone. We're going to talk about obstetric anesthesia. So I would like to invite, we have three uh, prominent speakers in this field, uh, all from USA. <laughs> so I think it's a good evening for all panelists. I would like to welcome Professor Rulhak Derby Toledano, Professor Barbara Scafone, and Professor Cynthia Wong. And for this session, it will be led by Dr. Rafidia from Indonesia and will be with me as well. So Dr. Rafidia, I think you can introduce our speakers. Okay. Thank you, Krisa. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone, or evening, wherever you are. For now, uh, as Krisha mentioned, this is the third uh, session of obstetric anesthesia. Uh, Maybe uh, we can start. Yeah, uh, all the speakers uh, are famous, so I don't need to introduce them. Uh, they will present very, very interesting topic here. And for all participants, do not hesitate. If you have any question, please put it in Q&A box and all will be discussed at the end of the session. Okay. Uh, I invite the first speaker, Professor uh, Rohak uh, Darby Toledano. Hello, Darby. Hi. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, okay. it's clear. Excellent. I think you all have my um, PowerPoint. Yes. We yes. Do. Excellent. Okay, right. so um, I'm just going to ask you to forward it as I go. I'm, I'm so delighted to join you all. Um, I am going to talk about neuraxial procedures in obstetric patients with known thrombocytopenia, so with a known low platelet count, and we'll discuss the recent findings and consensus guidelines. Next slide. I have no disclosures. Unfortunately, I'm unable to join you by video because I'm just getting out of a short surgical procedure and I'm sitting in a small hotel room, but, um, but I'm pleased to be here nonetheless. Next slide. Okay, so what we're gonna do are there are objectives today are to discuss the risk of spinal epidural hematoma formation in, in obstetric patients with thrombocytopenia as defined by less than 100,000 platelet count. Next, we're gonna to move to a look at the Society for Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology 2021 consensus statement on neuraxial procedures in obstetric patients with thrombocytopenia. This is a, a great uh, new publication. It's one of the first um, national guidelines to help us get some guidance regarding performance of neuraxial procedures in obstetric patients with low platelet counts. And then we're going to close by looking at, um, by applying these guidelines 
to three different case scenarios. Next slide. Well, what do we know already? Uh, we know that neuraxial procedures like epidural labor techniques and spinals and, and epidurals for cesarean delivery anesthesia are, are the preferred techniques in obstetric patients. But we also know that until recently, we've had no consensus or no guidelines really to help us determine when it's appropriate to proceed with a, a neuraxial procedure in plate patients with low platelets. So we just have been unable to have a, a clear platelet threshold at which we, we know it's likely safe to proceed with these neuraxial procedures. And obviously this is relevant to so many of us who take care of obstetric patients um, because up to 12% of obstetric patients have a thrombocytopenia of some sort. And that's a, a, not a severe thrombocytopenia. That's a thrombocytopenia is defined as less than 150,000. And roughly 1% of those patients, of that 12%, have a severe thrombocytopenia as defined by less than 100,000. So we are gonna encounter this quite frequently. We also know that most of these patients that have thrombocytopenias have um, common sources of a thrombocytopenia, such as gestational thrombocytopenia, immune thrombocytopenia, which we previously called idiopathic thrombocytopenia of pregnancy or uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura and thrombocytopenia associated with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy like preeclampsia and help. So we know that they often have these common ideologies and we will see it on the labor and delivery floor. Oh, next slide, please. So again, the question is how low can we go to safely perform a neuraxial procedure? What is our platelet threshold at which we can feel fairly comfortable that we can proceed with a neuraxial procedure? And until recently, again, we haven't had many um, much guidance on this front. Next slide. So, in an effort to, to determine the incidence of spinal epidural hematoma, this, um, this study, a, a systematic review and meta-analysis was undertaken looking at lumbar procedures in patients across all populations. So not only obstetric patients or not only pediatric oncologic patients or adult patients with liver disease, this study in an effort to find out the incidence of spinal epidural hematoma um, in patients with thrombocytopenia gathered data from all the literature from 1947 until 2018 when the analysis was undertaken. And that's from the beginning of the electronic databases until the present day at the time. And uh, again, data from all procedures in the lumbar region across patients of all populations with a uh, platelet count below 100,000. And the, the uh, authors collected the data regarding the type of procedure that the patient had such as a lumbar puncture or an epidural or a combined spinal epidural uh, or, uh, or epidural catheter removal. And we collected data on the patient population. And again, there were very diverse patient populations in this study. Um, the ideology of, thromb of the thrombocytopenia, whether it was related to liver disease or worsening a, um, systemic HIV, or in the, in the case of um, the obstetric patients, maybe gestational thrombocytopenia or immune thrombocytopenia, et cetera. 
We collected the platelet count at the time of the procedure, at the time that the procedure was performed, and whether a spinal epidural hematoma developed. We also collected data on the age of the patient, the, um, the number of attempts, whether it was a traumatic attempt, whether the patient had received uh, a, um, a platelet transfusion prior to the um, procedure, et cetera. And again, this was just an effort to get some idea of the risk of spinal epidural hematoma in patients with thrombocytopenia. Next slide. So again, in this study, um, over the period from 1947 until 2018, so over 7,500 procedures were performed in, plate, in patients with platelet counts below 100,000. And again, these procedures were, um, were published in, it could have been abstracts, it could have been posters, case series, case studies, or case reports, you know, various, various, every type of, uh, of, of published or even you know abstracts and platelet and posters, all sorts of um, of available evidence um, of those seven thousand five hundred procedures uh, performed in patients with low platelet counts. Sixty seven percent were lumbar punctures, so that's largely in patients like pediatric and adult oncological patients who need to do repeat. Um, lumbar punctures to see if there's a central nervous system involvement of the of the cancer, or who need to get an LP to have um, chemotherapeutic agents deposited in their cerebral spinal fluid. So again, most of these um, these procedures performed in thrombocytopenic patients were lumbar punctures, and the patient populations that received these procedures at low platelet counts were predominantly pediatric oncologic patients. There were adult onco oncology patients. 32% uh, were obstetric patients. It also included you know, general surgical adult patients, patients with known liver disease, you know, patients with sepsis, et cetera. And of all of these procedures uh, performed in patients with thrombocytopenia, as defined as below 100, Thousand, 33 um, spinal epidural hematomas were reported. So 33 out of 7,509 procedures in the lumbar region. 75% of those spinal epidural hematomas that were reported were in patients after who received lumbar punctures and, and most commonly in patients with a platelet count below 50,000. There were five cases in obstetric patients um, and the range of platelets was 44,000 to 91,000. Um, you know, incidentally or of note, uh, one of those obstetric patients had an underlying AVM where the um, spinal technique was performed. It was unknown, so an unknown spinal pathology. Two of the patient of the obstetric patients who developed um, spinal epidural hematomas had HELP syndrome. One had preeclampsia. One had an accidental epidural catheter removal. Uh, she was coagulopathic and um, it was in accidentally removed during um, transport after uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Next slide. And the conclusions from this broad meta-analysis um, was that spinal epidural hematoma formation at a platelet count below 75,000 is, is low, it's relatively low with an event rate of 0.97%. And that's reflected in the number of 33 out of 7,509 procedures. Again, just to recall that most of those 33 spinal epidural hematomas that were reported in the literature from 1947 until 2018 um, developed after lumbar punctures, 
and most commonly with platelet, it's below 50,000. Um, the adult oncology uh, patient population had the highest incidence. And ultimately, the conclusion from that study was that OB patients are at relatively low risk of developing spinal epidural hematoma, in part for known reasons, such as their hypercoagulable uh, state of pregnancy or the low risk of or the low incidence of spinal uh, pathology, uh, the, the fairly compliant epidural space in the lumbar region where we perform all of these procedures. Also, obstetric patients tend to be, you know, have a lower risk, obviously, of being on anticoagulants vis-a-vis -vis the older surgical population. So in general, obstetric patients tend to have a relatively low risk of, lower risk of spinal epidural hematoma. Um, next slide, please. Another finding from this meta-analysis was that the vast majority of these spinal epidural hematomas in thrombocytopenic patients developed within 48 hours after the procedure was performed. So it's really important for us to maintain vigilance for two days, 48 hours after the procedure in patients in which we have some concern. And we, you know, we often know what the presenting signs and symptoms that we're looking for are, but the meta-analysis substantiated that, that 59% uh, presented with lower extremity motor weakness or deficits, about 45% presented with lower back pain or low back pain and lower extremity pain. 32% presented with paresthesias and 27% had bowel or bladder dysfunction. So again, it's important to keep an eye out on for these patients for 48 hours after procedure and to look for specific weakness or deficits or low back pain, et cetera. Next slide, please. So while that meta-analysis was underway, the Society for Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology uh, developed a task force with groups from multiple, multiple disciplines and multiple professional societies. And in order to establish a consensus statement on neuraxial procedures in obstetric patients. And, and the purpose was to provide us with some, um, with the best available evidence and a clinical decision aid to inform a risk benefit discussion regarding the safety of proceeding with a neuraxial technique in a patient, in an obstetric patient with um, thrombocytopenia. And this task force, again, that was underway at the same time, at the tail end of the previous study, um, gathered additional information in the, in the literature, in the published literature, and sent out surveys and questionnaires and expert and sought expert opinion to develop a guideline or this rather a consensus statement. Again, the purpose is to provide the best available evidence and a clinical decision aid to inform the risk benefits and options of performing these procedures in obstetric patients with known thrombocytopenia ideologies like gestational thrombocytopenia, uh, immune thrombocytopenia, and uh, uh, thrombocytopenia associated with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. This consensus statement was not intended to establish a standard of care of any sort, and certainly not intended to replace clinical judgment, because we're, we're absolutely at our, um, uh, in the right to, to use our clinical judgment um, and, and degree of, of comfort, et cetera, when we determine um, whether to proceed or not with a neuraxial procedure. Next, um, next slide, please. So just to reiterate, this is a, a, a quote from the consensus statement. It is not intended to set a legal standard of care and does not replace medical care 
or the judgment of the responsible medical professional considering all of the circumstances presented by an individual patient. The consensus statement is not intended to ensure a successful patient outcome in every situation and is not a guarantee of a specific outcome. But again, it serves to, um, to provide the avail best available evidence and to give us some clinical decision aid before we make these decisions. Next slide. So one of the really important aspects of the consensus statement is to start any, when you meet any patient or any patient whom you're considering providing a neuraxial technique for, it's really important to elicit a bleeding history and evaluate whether there's any concern for um, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Um, in, in fact, a, a large percentage, I think 27% of the patients in the previous meta-analysis had known bleeding histories or overt signs and symptoms of DIC when the procedure was performed. So this just highlights that how important it is for us to elicit a bleeding history. And there's a very important table in that consensus statement from the Society for Obstetric Anesthesia and Perinatology that describes, that helps guide us to ask the appropriate questions. Like um, we can ask about a uh, history of heavy menstrual bleeding and it's defined by a certain number of days or a history of postpartum hemorrhage. Do you, does a person have a history of surgical related bleeding? or bleeding after dental procedures? Does a person report any spontaneous bleeding events like gastrointestinal bleeds, intraarticular bleeds, and central nervous system bleeds? Or does the patient have any signs and symptoms of two of the following? Frequent epistaxis and nosebleeds. And again, that frequency is defined in the table. Severe, easy bruising, prolonged bleeding after minor injury, except, or family history of bleeding symptoms. So again, let's start by eliciting a bleeding history and evaluating for any signs and symptoms of DIC. Next slide. And the findings overall of the consensus statement, again, they gathered more information than the previous meta-analysis. And the previous meta-analysis, if you recall, uh, 75,000 was a platelet threshold at which it, um, spinal epidural hematoma was likely to be very low. Well, when the additional, in the consensus statement, additional information was garnered and, or gathered, and and, and, and the conclusion was that the risk of spinal epidural hematoma with platelets below 70,000 in patients with a known thrombocytopenia ideology is likely very low. So obstetric patients with platelets, um, uh, uh, oh God, I'm sorry, platelets above 70,000 is likely very low. So platelet count above. So that little, um, that, that little sign has to be changed. Platelet counts above 70,000 in a patient with a known etiology of thrombocytopenia is a likely very low incidence of a spinal epidural hematoma formation. However, at platelet counts between 50 and 70,000 in, in obstetric patients with known thrombocytopenia etiology, um, there, there may be an increased risk of spinal epidural hematoma. And in those settings, we need to, uh, or we're encouraged to perform an individualized risk benefit analysis prior to proceeding with neuraxial technique. So specifically weigh the risks of spinal epidural hematoma formation versus the potential risks of inducing general anesthesia or alternatively, the risks of withholding neuraxial techniques and performing a general anesthetic. And below 50,000 platelet count, there's likely, there's an increased risk of spinal epidural hemato hematoma formation 
and it may be reasonable to avoid neuraxial procedures. So again, above 70,000 in patients with known thrombocytopenia, likely very low incidence of spinal epidural hematoma. At 50 to 70,000, we should, we're encouraged to perform a risk benefit analysis, weighing the risks of spinal epidural hematoma formation versus general anesthesia, the risks of inducing general anesthesia. And below 50,000, there may be an increased risk, may likely be an increased risk of spinal epidural hematoma formation, and you might consider avoiding neuraxial procedures. Next slide. Um, now, there's always an issue, question about when we should order platelets and how often do we need platelets um, prior to performance of our neuraxial technique in obstetric patients. You know, do we need Pay, uh, platelets within 12 hours for patients who have preeclampsia with severe features or 24 hours or four hours. And, 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 and the authors found that, um, it, it, that it's, it's not clear in, uh, in most patients. There's, not a, a, there's no clear guideline regarding the frequency uh, and the timeline of your platelet count prior to procedure, performing your procedure. However, in patients with HELP syndrome, you know, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets, those patients may benefit from a more recent platelet count prior to initiation of your blockade. And that's because they tend to drop fairly precipitously. So six hours is a reasonable a time frame to get your platelet count before um, performance of, an, of a um, neuraxial technique in a patient with HELP syndrome. Um, the, the consensus statement found that there's little evidence regarding the utility of other lab tests to help aid our decision making, like the PT and PTT and thromboelastogram, you know, in the old days bleeding time. There's little evidence to suggest that those, um, currently little evidence to suggest that, that will, those additional studies help us reliably in our decision making. And another thing was that um, there was the, the consensus um, group found that it's unlikely that platelet transfusion prior to initiation of a procedure is unlikely to benefit the patient and has several risks. Next slide. So here is the decision tree, the, the uh, cl clinical decision aid. And we've looked at it at the top. We are going to rule out whether there's uh, any signs of uh, intravascular coagulopathy. We're going to evaluate for bleeding, you know, epistaxis, mucocutaneous bleeding, et cetera. If there are no signs of DIC or a bleeding history, and we know the ideology of the thrombocytopenia on the left side, which is most commonly immune thrombocytopenia, gestational thrombocytopenia, or thrombocytopenia associated with hypertensive disorders. And then the platelet count is above, at or above 70,000. It's likely safe to proceed. And there's likely in the green box, a low risk of spinal epidural hematoma. Now, in the patients that don't have a platelet count, who have a known um, ideology and have a platelet count below 70,000, you move to the box on the right, and, um, which is the little orange pink box, and we see that a platelet count between 50 and 70 likely warrants an individualized risk benefit analysis. And then below 50,000, there, there may likely be an increased risk of spinal epidural hematoma. So that's the decision aid. Now we're going to apply it quickly to three different scenarios. Next slide. All right, case one. We have a 30-year-old G2P0 at 35 weeks gestation. She's had elevated blood pressure for 24 hours, a severe headache. She denies any bleeding diathesis and has no family history of bleeding. However, she has some uteroplacental insufficiency as manifested in a category two tracing. Next slide. 
Her platelet count is 82,000. She has a malampati three and she's got a body mass index of 40. And she is slated for an urgent cesarean delivery for category two tracing, preeclampsia with severe features. And the question is, what is our anesthetic? Next slide. So we look at our, um, our decision aid and we see that she denies any bleeding history. She has a known etiology of a thrombocytopenia, that being preeclampsia. Her platelets are above 70,000 and to the left in the green box, it's likely safe to proceed, likely a low risk of spinal epidural hematoma. Next slide. Here we have a 33 year old G3 P2 at term gestation at 40 weeks with a known history of immune thrombocytopenia. She's in labor and she has a, she's planning a vaginal delivery. Her platelets throughout pregnancy have been 80 to 90,000. She's followed by a hematologist because she has known immune thrombocytopenia. She denies any bleeding diatheses of any sort. Next slide. So even though her platelets have generally run 80 to 90, her platelets are currently 70,000. Her malampati is class two. She has a BMI of 35. Um, so she's an otherwise healthy G3P2 with known immune thrombocytopenia requesting an epidural labor analgesia. Next slide. So again, we start at the top and we, we acknowledge that she has no signs of DIC or no bleeding diathesis, no family history, except known immune thrombocytopenia. We know her ideology of thrombocytopenia, which is the immune sort. Her platelets are currently at or above 70,000. And again, if we're gonna use this clinical decision aid, in the green box, we see that it's likely a low risk for spinal epidural hematoma and likely safe to proceed. Now let's move to the last scenario. Next slide. Uh, we have a 29 year old G2P1 at 32 weeks gestation. She has new onset elevated blood pressure and abdominal pain. She has some signs of, of uteroplacental insufficiency again. She's got a category tr two tracing. It's unclear from what. Next slide. Her labs reveal that she has a class four airway and a large BMI of, of 50. Her platelets are 67,000 and she has elevated um, liver enzymes. Her ALT and AST are twice normal. Her coagulation profile, which the obstetricians sent for concern for help are normal. Again, she denies a bleeding history. So the assessment of plan in this patient is we're, we're gonna proceed with an urgent delivery, cesarean delivery in this G2P1 with preeclampsia and severe features, help syndrome, and a su suspected placental abruption. So the question is, what is the anesthetic for this situation? Next page or next slide. All right, we know that she denies bleeding diathesis. We know that we have a known ideology of thrombocytopenia, which is the hypertensive disorder of pregnancy consistent with HELP syndrome on the right side of the chart. Um, we've had a recent platelet count. I believe it was 67,000. So that's a little bit below the, the safe, more safe considered threshold of 70,000. But what we can do here is follow the algorithm down and say we do know that there's a known ideology and that is HELP syndrome. And for, again, we're in the orange uh, pink box. We can see that at this stage, we should perform an individualized risk benefit analysis, weighing the risk of spinal epidural hematoma um, versus the risks of complications of GA. In this case, she had a malampati four and she was a large lady with a high BMI. So, um, so I might elect and I would elect to proceed with a single shot spinal or if there was concern for bleeding 
with a catheter based technique. Next slide. All right, if anybody has any questions, please um, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much for joining me and permitting me to be with you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Darby. Interesting presentation. Uh, maybe you can look at the Q&A box. There's a question for you uh, and you may answer those, okay? Uh, next, time for the second speaker. Please welcome Professor Barbara Scafone. Hello, Barbara. Hello. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandra, for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I think I have to go up here to do this. Other day for some reason. Um, give me one second here. For some reason, the other day I had to do it a different way. Um, there. Is that working for everyone? Yes. Can you see my slide? Okay. Yes, Barbara. Thank you. We're going to be talking today about team responses during obstetric hemorrhage. I do not have any disclosures other than to let you know that my Wi-Fi has been a little bit um, iffy today. Currently, it seems fine. If for some reason you're having trouble, if someone could find some way to let me know, I think many of you have my cell phone number. I've got it right next to me because I can go on a hotspot, which won't take me more than one or two minutes. But I think that it is... Um, for now, it seems okay. Okay, here are our learning objectives. I wanna go through some definitions and go through um, the uh, epidemiology and impact of obstetric hemorrhage and talk a little bit about preventability. And we'll go into um, the coordinated team responses, which will include early assessment and early escalation of treatment. So these are the very uh, uh, traditional definitions of postpartum hemorrhage, which I'm going to be um, abbreviating postpartum uh, PPH. Um, we talk about a greater than 500 milliliter blood loss after a vaginal delivery or a greater than 1000 milliliter blood loss after um, cesarean delivery and that severe postpartum hemorrhage is often defined as either greater than 1,000 or sometimes greater than 2,000. But a lot of people criticize these definitions because they're not that much more than what we sometimes see after normal deliveries. And also there's no reason to really think that dependent on mode of delivery that a woman can tolerate different amounts of blood loss. So, um, the American College of, Obst of Obstetricians and Gynecologists published this document in 2014 um, in an attempt to standardize certain definitions. And at least for the purposes of reporting and for research, the suggestion is that you define early postpartum hemorrhage, which means within 24 hours, as a cumulative blood loss of um, greater than or equal to one liter of blood loss. Um, and because we know that we're not always good at quantifying blood loss, they also suggest that even if you don't think you're at 1000, if the patient has signs and symptoms of hypovolemia, that you still consider that postpartum hemorrhage. And of course, these are the signs and symptoms of, post, of hypovolemia that I'm sure you're all um, familiar with. And so regarding the epidemiology and impact, hemorrhage accounts for 27% of maternal deaths worldwide. Of course, there's great variation um, in different places in the world. What you can see on uh, this graph is um, on the left, it's hemorrhages um, uh, represented as a percentage of all deaths. Again, this is worldwide data. And on the right, it's represented by number of deaths. And you can see the light pink is older data and the darker pink is kind of newer data. So you can see that we are making some headway, at least worldwide, on hemorrhage. 
What do the numbers look, or I should say on deaths from hemorrhage, what do the numbers look like in Indonesia? So if you look along the uh, x-axis here, you see years, and we're going to go right to the uh, to the uh, y-axis here on the right side of the slide. The red line represents the maternal mortality ratio in general. So it appears to be improving over um, a few decades here in Indonesia. And what you see on this side is as that has been decreasing, it is a, the decrease is attributed at least in part to just increases in the um, some of the what we call social determinants of health. So just as you have more skilled birth attendants and as you increase your economic and educational levels that you see decreases in um, your maternal mortality ratio. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but um, again, this is um, Indonesian data. Um, and these are the causes of death here along the bottom. And you can, the, uh, as you go from left to right here, the blue is older data, the yellow is the most recent data, but you can look at them all together because it hasn't changed that much over the past several years. Um, you can just see that hemorrhage here, postpartum bleeding is um, a major contributor to um, maternal deaths. And so let's talk about this issue of preventability. Um, I'm going to show you some data that comes out of the United States and some also that comes out of France. I think it's probably the best data that we have regarding preventability. And it's not necessarily that you can prevent all cases of hemorrhage, but that you can prevent severe hemorrhage and you can prevent severe morbidity and mortality that can result from hemorrhage. And so let's look at this. This is the data from uh, the state of California in the United States, where um, they have been working on this issue of preventability for a couple decades now. Um, it's a little bit of a busy slide. These are the various causes right here in the middle is obstetric hemorrhage. Um, they looked at all the deaths in the state and what they determined, they had a panel look to see whether there was any chance of preventability of the sequelae, again, the morbidity and mortality. And what they decided is that there was a good to strong chance to alter 41% of these deaths, but specifically, there was a good to strong chance to alter 70% of the hemorrhage related deaths. And they took a deeper dive and tried to determine why uh, you know, what the causes of preventability were, whether they were due to provider-related factors, system-related factors, or certain patient-related factors. And again, this is the um, uh, hemorrhage data here. And what you're seeing here uh, represented in the different colors is the different causes of uh, preventability. Um, they determined that most of the uh, cases of preventability had to do with provider or system related errors, and it had to do with ineffective care. And that ineffective care usually had to do with delays in diagnosis or treatment. And this is a theme that you're going to find when it comes to preventability of hemorrhage. This is some data from France. Um, this group looked at all cases of hemorrhage but they separated out a group of people that hemorrhaged severely. So had either a higher volume of blood loss or required invasive procedures to control the blood loss or developed a coagulopathy, or of course, if um, any of them uh, progressed to having a mortality. And then they tried to determine what factors were associated with these more severe states of hemorrhage. And what you see here on this slide is that delays in care, delays of oxytocin administration by as little as 10 minutes were associated with an increased odds of having severe versus non-severe hemorrhage. Similarly, certain delays in obstetric care and here delays in calling for both obstetric and anesthesia assistance, again, by as little as 10 minutes. Um, increase the odds of severe versus non-severe hemorrhage. 
Interestingly, and since we're an audience of um, anesthesiologists, epidural analgesia seemed to decrease the risk, seems to cut in half the odds of um, having severe hemorrhage. And that is probably related to the fact that um, it just allows for like a faster manual exploration and treatment. And it also may just be um, a sign that the obstetric and anesthesia assistance is close by. Um, again, when they did the deeper dive, they decided they determined that these delays were associated with increasing severity of hemorrhage. And so that is what has led to the idea that um, perhaps we needed another response to hemorrhage, some way to have an organized, comprehensive response that would um, eliminate or at least greatly decrease some of these delays in both diagnosis and treatment of hemorrhage. And so before we go into the details of that, um, we're going to ask the question, do these uh, comprehensive approaches to protocolized care and and um, using early warning triggers and um, doing drills, you know, team drills on your labor and delivery unit. Do these things work to, to decrease morbidity and mortality? And so a lot of the data comes from the state of California because they were leaders in, um, at least in the United States, they were leaders in uh, applying some of these principles to maternal morbidity and mortality. And so this group, you'll notice a lot of the same names on these papers. Um, so um, a lot of the data comes from these four papers. Basically, in the state of California, they greatly encouraged and even in some cases mandated certain responses to maternal care. And a lot of the data, some of it comes from just like one hospital, um, that's the one at the top, um, or hospital systems. Some of these data were pulled from large regions of the state. And so altogether, these are, this represents tens of thousands of deliveries. And this is what some of their results look like. And this can be a little bit of a confusing slide, but what they're looking at is the pre-protocolized uh, care period and the post-protocolized care period. So they looked at historical controls and then they introduced this more comprehensive approach to hemorrhage and um, looked sometime later in the post-protocolized um, period. And basically they were trying to determine what percentage of patients was successfully treated at early stages of hemorrhage? In other words, before they progressed to losing um, higher amounts or to developing coagulopathies or to developing other morbidities. And what they determined was that in the pre-protocol period, only about a third, 33% of patients who presented with, with what they called stage one, which is the very earliest degree of hemorrhage, were successfully treated at that stage. Whereas afterwards, 82%, so really the vast majority were successfully treated at stage one and never progressed to more severe degrees of hemorrhage or those associated with a morbidity or a coagulopathy. Similarly, of those patients that did progress to stage two, how many of, or rather what proportion of them were successfully treated at that stage and did not necessarily progress to stage three? And again, in the pre-protocol period, only about 8%, so really a small proportion, versus in the post-protocol period, about half of them were successfully treated at that stage. The last thing that they were able to um, uh, determine was that the rate of transfusion in terms of how many units were transfused per month without any change in um, the number of births during those two six month periods. Um, and the rate of transfusion went down. And it was thought because they were recognizing and treating this earlier 
that patients were losing as much blood, but in addition, patients were less likely to develop a coagulopathy and therefore didn't necessarily need as many non-red cell blood products. Um, this is more data, kind of uh, uh, same principle. They're looking at um, a pre and a post comprehensive approach, protocolized um, approach period. Uh, in this particular table, they're reporting, um, these investigators are reporting the change. And what you're seeing here really is that there was a decrease in the rate of transfusion. Um, they were about a drop in about 25% uh, in the rate of transfusion in the pre versus post um, protocol period. In addition, there seemed to be a drop in hysterectomy, even with the large numbers, you'll see it didn't quite um, reach significance. Um, but there was at least some trend towards fewer hysterectomies needed. Putting all of these papers together, what we can say is that by instituting some sort of a comprehensive team response to hemorrhage that includes early warning tools, protocolized clinical pathways and team drills, decreases the severity of hemorrhage, decreases the rate of development of uh, DIC or coagulopathy, decreases both the rate of transfusion and the number of transfusions. So in other words, the proportion of patients transfused as well as the number of units those patients get. Um, using uh, a larger data set, they were actually able to demonstrate a decrease in the rate of hysterectomy that uh, was uh, statistically significant. And it also decreased maternal morbidity, uh, which was, uh, they used a definition that's used by the CDC um, that involves um, a, a lot of discharge codes, um, a formula used that's been validated. And um, importantly, it also increases staff knowledge and staff confidence at handling these obstetric emergencies. And so those are all the why. Um, so, so a few years ago, um, a group of both obstetricians, nurse midwives, anesthesiologists, nurse anesthetists, et cetera, um, uh, known as the National Partnership for Maternal Safety, published a consensus bundle on obstetric hemorrhage. Here are the references. Um, at the time, it was accompanied by an editorial in Anesthesia and Analgesia basically calling anesthesiologists to action to become peripartum physicians rather than just purveyors of labor analgesia and anesthesia for you know, obstetric surgical procedures. Um, the, I guess I should go up one side, the National Partnership for Maternal Safety morphed into the uh, Council on Patient Safety for Women's Healthcare. And because that was a little bit of a mouthful, they have morphed again into this AIM or AIM. It's the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health. And this is their um, website. It's just safehealthcareforeverywoman.org. And on it, you can find what they call patient safety bundles, which are just evidence-based um, uh, simple steps that you can um, apply to um, obstetric care with the aim to decrease morbidity and mortality. The core safety bundles include one for hemorrhage. Okay. If you click on that button, you will find something that looks like this. Now, this is the PDF version, but um, Online, you will also find all of these same categories and all of these same um, bullet points, but they will be accompanied by tools too, uh, which we'll get into here as we talk about this. But all of these um, patient bundles are um, organized by what we call the four R's, readiness, recognition and prevention, response and reporting. So under readiness, you see that you're expected to have a cart. So you have all your supplies and checklists all in one place. Um, 
Sorry about that. And then you have to know where your medications are so you can get at them very quickly. And very important, establish a response team. Who are you going to call? And who you call might be different than who I call. I work in an academic medical center. There are anesthesiologists. They're on the service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, uh, we're very close to our pharmacy and our blood bank. If you have a different practice setting, your response team is going to look very different than mine. So it's not important for you to establish a response team that looks like my response team it's important for you to establish a response team. You also need to decide how you're going to get um, large numbers of blood products. Again, mm -hmm. I work in a tertiary care center. We've worked that out with our blood bank. You may be in a very different practice setting and you may it might be much more difficult for you to work out how, how you're going to get large numbers of blood products when you need them. I do wanna talk a little bit about doing unit-based unit drills and post drill debriefs. I think these are really, really important to practice these and just make sure everything's going to go as smoothly as you think it will. There's a lot of data to show us that performing drills improves interstaff communication, but it also improves staff to patient communication. It gives you a chance to identify your own provider errors in knowledge and management. And it gives you a chance to identify your latent systems errors, meaning, gee, maybe it's this, this plan I had for getting blood products doesn't work as well as I thought it would. Or this plan I had for getting tranexamic acid doesn't work as well as we thought it would. What do we need to fix? The next R is recognition and prevention. And so we talk about assessing hemorrhage risk but also measuring cumulative blood loss um, formally and as quantitatively as possible. And I, I do wanna kind of talk about this one a little bit too, because this is really important. Um, the, along the x-axis here, you see spontaneous vaginal delivery, operative vaginal delivery and cesarean delivery, but it doesn't really matter which one of these you look at because they're all the same. The white boxes, um, uh, I'm sorry, the gray boxes represent the estimated blood loss, what the caregivers thought the patient lost. The white boxes represent the actual blood loss. And what you need to find, learn here is that we all are very bad at estimating blood loss. We underestimate. We tend to, it's not necessarily shown on this slide, but we tend to overestimate at low amounts and we tend to underestimate at large amounts. And what's not shown here is that as the amounts get higher and higher, our estimates become more and more inaccurate. The good news is that it's easy to teach people, um, even just didactics, teaching people, okay, one soaking wet surgical lap holds 100 milliliters of blood, just teaching them that, or doing simulation-based education where you, um, you know, throw a, a known quantity of uh, blood that you can get when it's um, expired from the blood bank and uh, onto uh, commonly used items and people learn what that looks like. It's important to separate non-blood fluids. So when you're doing a cesarean delivery, um, suction out your amniotic fluid separately. Be careful about doing things like emptying urine into the um, drape that's below the underbuttocks drape. You should be weighing all pads and bedding, et cetera, and using calibrated drapes. And what a calibrated drape looks like basically is this, although now you can get some that are, um, you know, manufactured more, you know, precisely, not just written on this way, but it's just much easier to quantify the blood loss when you use a, a um, calibrated drape. So doing quantified blood loss for every single patient, meaning you weigh the sponges and the laps every single time for every patient is really important. And then once you have your systems in place and you've instituted um, quantitative blood loss, so you are more likely to recognize hemorrhage, how do you respond to it? And this is where 
it's really important to develop some sort of a unit standard stage based meaning that your response differs as hemorrhage becomes more and more severe. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, obstetric hemorrhage emergency management plan with checklist. What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? What are you going to do once you recognize hemorrhage? Now, it can be very, very intimidating writing a hemorrhage protocol. I wrote one with, for our unit together with my obstetric colleagues and my nursing colleagues, of course. And it was intimidating for me and I, and I helped formulate this document. So I know how intimidating this is. I'm going to take you back to the AIM website, safehealthcareforeverywoman.com. As I said, uh, you can get the PDF version, but you can also get this web-based version. And when you go look under response, you'll see resources. You can click on any one of these and it will show you, you know, what ACOG's protocol looks like. You can see what the state of California's protocol looks like. So in other words, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to start from scratch. You can look and see what other people have done, and then you can put it together, uh, you know, modify it, you know, for your own practice setting. So I really do recommend to everyone that you commit this um, website to memory, self health, sorry, safe healthcare for every woman.org. So I just want to spend the last few minutes showing you the, um, the protocol that we have in place at the University of Chicago. Again, not because it's important um, that you, that your protocol looks like mine, but I just want to show you what some of the important elements are. So first of all, as you can see, it's a team-based response. So everything on this column is done by nursing and everything in this column is done by the obstetrician and everything on this column is done by the anesthesiologist. So it's a team response. Also, you can see it's stage-based. So this is what you do for all patients. Here's where you're suspecting a little more blood. Here's where you're between a liter and 1500. Here's where you're at 1500, or maybe you suspect some uh, coagulopathy. Okay, so it's stage based. Um, again, the T, we quantify all blood loss. So every all blood loss gets weighed and quantified stage based. There's our team. You have to have some way of calling people. So we happen to have a system. You'll have your own way. Um, you know, one of the things about obstetric hemorrhage is that the coagulopathy can uh, occur out of proportion to the degree of blood loss. I could give you a whole lecture on that. And in this case, you'll just have to take my word for it. But so your, your protocol should emphasize very early on, perhaps coagulopathy um, and continuing that throughout the um, event. Um, you'll want to, to figure out some way to um, how you're going to use tranexamic acid. And I think after the woman was trial, the woman trial was published. We all realize that there's a place for tranexamic acid in our hemorrhage protocols. I think a lot of us struggle a little bit. So keep in mind that I work in a high resource setting. Our particular protocol calls for considering tranexamic acid once we're at about a liter. And then if you get to 1500 and you haven't given it um, to give it then, but you're going to have to consider your practice setting and how you interpret the literature on tranexamic acid. Again, you're going to have to figure out some way to um, get your blood products. These are just the important elements on this. Um, response, there's one more R, reporting systems and learning. So doing huddles for your high-risk patients, um, reviewing cases once they've occurred for preventability, and then monitoring your own outcomes and process metrics, meaning are people using these um, protocols correctly and are they making a difference? 
If anybody is um, wants to see my protocol, again, just so that you have a prototype, please feel free to email me. This is my email address here, bscavone at dacc.uchicago.edu. And that is all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. What a presentation. This is very important uh, because of obstetric hemorrhage correlated to maternal mortality, isn't it? And you remind us to build a good team and the team must respond appropriate to make it work. Okay, uh, you can see in the Q&A box, please, uh, Barbara. And now uh, we move to third speaker. Uh, I invite uh, Professor Cynthia Wong. Hello, Cynthia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Good evening or good morning to you. Yeah. Let me get my full slide up here. Yes. And then you can tell me if it's working. Yeah. Put it in the full screen. Yep. Hang on. Okay. 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 Great. So thank you for inviting me to the meeting. I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about failed epidural anesthesia for cesarean delivery, how to prevent it and how to rescue it. So many women in labor, uh, at least in the United States, have epidural analgesia, and sometimes they have to have an intrapartum cesarean delivery, and so we'll use the epidural catheter for cesarean delivery. So I want to discuss how we can ensure that this epidural catheter is going to work um, for, for cesarean delivery. For the purposes of this talk, I don't have any disclosures to make, although we will talk about off-label use of drugs. These are drugs that have not been approved for use in the epidural space, or at least some of them have not been approved. And at the end of this lecture, I'd like you to be able to demonstrate knowledge of the incidence and risk factors for failed epidural surgical anesthesia for cesarean delivery and employ evidence-based strategies to treat failed surgical epidural anesthesia. Let's just start by discussing why this is important. The American Society of Anesthesiologists has a closed claims database, which is essentially a database of many lawsuits um, that have medical lawsuits that have been filed in the United States. And if you compare maternal claims to non-obstetric claims, you can see that for pain during anesthesia, there is a lot uh, there are a lot more claims for pain during anesthesia for obstetric cases than for non-obstetric cases. And similarly, there's a much higher percent of um, emotional distress associated with maternal claims compared to non-obstetric claims. And this is because um, a large proportion of our patients are awake during cesarean delivery, and it's our job to make sure that they're awake but also anesthetized. What is the incidence of failed epidural analgesia? It varies uh, depending on where you look. This is, uh, these are data from Australia from a number of years ago. And if you look at the bottom there, you can see that epidural anesthesia for cesarean, about one in 150 to one in 200, um, they needed to convert to general anesthesia. So this is about 0.5%. Um, um, in contrast, here's another study. These are data from Duke University in the United States. And at the bottom row, you can see that 4.3% of their epidural catheters uh, were converted to general anesthesia for cesarean delivery. So I'm not going to show you all of the studies, but uh, depending on where you look, the incidence of failed epidural anesthesia for cesarean delivery and need to convert to general anesthesia varies from 4% to 13%. 13% seems an awfully high number to me, and I think this is something that we want to avoid. I think we'll all agree that if we can avoid general anesthesia, it is better for our patients. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that our epidural catheters work. What are risk factors for failed epidurals at cesarean delivery? Again, there have been a number of observational studies looking at what predicts failure. Um, these studies have identified a variety of variables. Um, here in this study from Israel, you see that younger age predicts failure, um, bigger BMI or, or, or um, 
uh, heavier weight patients predicts failure um, and advanced gestational age was also associated with an increased risk of failure. Many of the databases have shown that more than one clinician top up during labor is associated with an increased risk of um, failure of the epidural at cesarean uh, delivery. In other words, uh, the patient has epidural analgesia for labor and presumably we're using an infusion or a PCEA pump or some way to maintain analgesia. When the patient, that's not adequate for the patient, in other words, the patient has breakthrough pain and the physician has to go into the room and top up the epidural, um, this is associated uh, with an increased risk for um, failure uh, at uh, cesarean delivery. This, again, another study from Stanford in the United States shows the same thing, extra bolus doses of um, labor analgesia during labor are an increased risk of the epidural catheter failing at C-section. Here's another um, uh, study from the group in Singapore showing the same thing. So, you know, one thing that's important to do is that if you're getting called into your labor room to assess breakthrough pain, you need to uh, critically assess whether the catheter is working and replace it if it's not, because the fact that you're getting called in the room is an indication that maybe your catheter is not going to get, uh, not going to work during cesarean delivery. Another um, factor that people have identified is whether the catheter is cited as part of an epidural or part of a combined spinal epidural technique. And a number of studies have shown that epidural catheters that are cited as part of a combined spinal epidural technique more often work for cesarean delivery than catheters that are cited as part of a uh, straight epidural technique. This may be because the, the placement of a um, spinal needle through the epidural needle and the return of CSF pretty much guarantees that the tip of the epidural needle is actually in the epidural space. Whereas if you don't have this confirmation, it depends on your skill as an anesthesiologist to be able to identify that the tip of the epidural needle is actually in the epidural space. Again, here's another study comparing CSE to epidural showing that the failure rate at surgery was lower with the CSE technique compared with the straight epidural technique. All right, another factor that may play a role is the length of catheter that is, is in the epidural space, that's threaded into the epidural space. Here's a study that was done a number of years ago uh, where the authors randomized catheters to being placed two centimeters, four centimeters, six centimeters, and eight centimeters into the epidural space. Again, these were labor epidural catheters. And what they found uh, makes complete sense that if the catheter is only placed in the epidural space for two centimeters, there's a pretty high rate of catheter dislodgement. You can see over here on the left side uh, and needing to replace the catheter. Whereas if the catheter was placed deeper, four, six, or eight, um, centimeters, then there was a lower risk of the catheter falling out, but a higher risk of unilateral analgesia. Now, this study was performed at a time when we were using relatively stiff catheters. Uh, most of us, at least in the United States, are using wire reinforced catheters now, and they're very flimsy. And they tend not to snake off to one side or the other. When you thread them in, they just coil where you, where you put them. So I suspect that this uh, rate of unilateral block is much lower now than it had been in the past. But um, there are other data which show that um, somewhere between four and six centimeters is probably the right length to thread into the epidural space for a labor catheter. If you put it in less than that, it's more likely to fall out. If you put it in more than that, you're more likely to get a uh, unilateral block. So let's go on to uh, what we're gonna do when the patient um, is, is, um, uh, is have, has a rest of labor or has a non-reassuring fetal heart rate tracing. And now we have to do a cesarean delivery, an intrapartum cesarean delivery in a woman who has an epidural catheter for labor. What are some tips? Well, one tip is to add a lipid-soluble opioid to your local anesthetic mixture. Uh, it could be either fentanyl or sufentanyl. By the way, these are examples of two drugs that are not approved for use in the epidural or the spinal space, although we do it all the time uh, and has a safety record of decades of use. 
um, but technically they're not approved for use uh, in the neuraxial canal. This was a Scandinavian study where the authors um, used 0.5% bupivacaine for um, the C-section. We, we don't use bupivacaine too often anymore, but this is what was used uh, when this study was published. And they randomized patients to get 0, 50, 75, or 100 mics of fentanyl um, along with the uh, local anesthetic, the bupivacaine. And if you look at the outcome of need for intraoperative IV supplementation, you can see that it was significantly higher in the group that didn't get any epidural opioid. So this group needed IV opioid during the procedure to keep them comfortable. And similarly, the incidence of nausea, which is usually an indication that the block is not dense enough, um, was higher in the group that uh, did not get any fentanyl. So, so this is a little bit counterintuitive that when you give fentanyl uh, during a C-section, you actually decrease the risk of um, uh, uh, nausea and um, vomiting. All right. This is a meta-analysis done by a group in the UK, again, looking at the addition of fentanyl to uh, local anesthetic. And what they found is not only did the fentanyl make the block denser, i.e. the patient was more comfortable during the procedure, but the block onset time was faster. Here, the mean difference was, was two minutes. So when we add fentanyl to our local anesthetic uh, for the C-section, the onset of analgesia is two minutes faster. And this may be critical uh, when we have an urgent situation, for example, when the fetus is not, um, is, is not doing well. Again, looking at various um, drug combinations for um, and comparing them for the need for interoperative supplementation, this meta-analysis showed that lidocaine, epidural, and fentanyl, that's what LEF is, results in less need for supplementation um, than um, levobupivacaine and or bupivacaine. So here we have 0.5% bupivacaine or 0.5%. 0.5% levobupivacaine. And the use of either lidocaine, ep uh, epinephrine, or fentanyl, we'll talk about this in a minute, epinephrine, uh, or 0.75% ropivacaine were superior to 0.5% bupivacaine and uh, levobupivacaine. All right, let's talk about epinephrine as an adjuvant, uh, particularly when added to lidocaine. So this was a study, again, uh, by the Stanford group a number of years ago, and they used 2% um, lidocaine, and uh, they compared a group that just got plain lidocaine to three groups that had varying concentrations of epinephrine. So group two had one to 400,000 of epinephrine, group three, one to 300,000, and group four, one to 2,000, 200,000 of epinephrine added to the 2% lidocaine. And they gave 20 milliliters of this solution. And then if it wasn't adequate for the uh, anesthesia, they supplemented it with chloropocaine. And what you can see here is group one, which was the lidocaine without the epinephrine, needed twice as much chloropocaine to make the patients comfortable compared to any one of the groups with the epinephrine. So I don't know if you've used 2% plain lidocaine. Uh, I do not find that it's a very good anesthetic for cesarean delivery. And I feel that you really need to add epinephrine if you're going to use lidocaine to get a dense enough block. Another thing that people have looked at is adding sodium bicarbonate to our um, anesthetic solution, particularly again, lidocaine solutions. So you'll recall that uh, lidocaine comes in several formulations. There is a pre-mixed version with epinephrine in it, and then there is plain lidocaine. The pH of the pre-mixed version is low, it's 4.5, whereas the, pre uh, the pH of the plain lidocaine is much higher, it's 6.5. And this is because in order to keep the epinephrine in solution, the pH needs to be lowered. So what's the issue with this? Well, we now know that local anesthetics are weak bases and they exist at an equilibrium between the unionized form 
I'm sorry, here's the unionized form or the ionized form. And it's the unionized form that crosses membranes. The PKA of um, local anesthetic solutions is above physiologic pH, which means that the local anesthetics are in a relatively acidic environment. And this pushes the equation in this direction and you end up with ionized uh, local anesthetic, which again, doesn't cross the membranes very easily. If we add bicarb to the solution and raise the pH, we push the equation back in the other direction and get more unionized local anesthetic, which can cross the membrane and work on the sodium receptors from the inside of the nerve cell, which is where, um, which is where local anesthetics work. So again, a number of studies looking at uh, outcomes when sodium bicarbonate is added to uh, lidocaine solutions with epinephrine. And here's uh, a study looking at onset of analgesia. And you can look at the bottom here. Um, bicarbonate was added to uh, uh, the local anesthetic solution to raise the, the pH close to physiologic pH. This was compared to um, uh, lidocaine solutions that did not have bicarb in it, and therefore the pH was, was low, 4.5. And you can see by the hatch marks, that the solutions that had bicarbonate in it, that the onset of analgesia was significantly faster. And the patients requiring additional local anesthetic were considerably lower, significantly lower, uh, in the groups where local um, bicarbonate was added to the, to, to the lidocaine solution. Here's um, a study from Singapore, again, comparing the addition of bicarbonate to pre-mixed 2% lidocaine with epinephrine. Remember I said that the premixed solution has a low pH, it's 4.5. And when we uh, add sodium bicarbonate to it, uh, we get a much faster onset. Here, the difference was 4.5 minutes of surgical anesthesia compared to using saline placebo. And again, when we have the situation of non-reassuring fetal status, that four minutes could make a difference. We look at the outcome of IV supplementation. Again, much lower um, use of supplementation when bicarbonate was added to the solution. So not only is the onset of the block faster, but the density of the block is better when we add um, bicarbonate to the solution. Again, presumably because we have more local anesthetic molecules that can cross the membrane and bind to um, sodium channels in the nerve tissue. All right, we will skip this one for a second. So another important um, aspect, I think, of making sure that one has good anesthesia, epidural anesthesia for cesarean delivery, is to pay particular attention to how we assess the level of the block. So high, how high is the block? And I think you all know that if we assess with different modalities, we'll get a different answer to this question. So this is a study looking at dermatome level here on the y-axis, minutes on the x-axis, so minutes after the local anesthetic was injected, and you can see that the levels go up, right? Um, but even when it's at the plateau level, if we test with a cold stimulus, we get a much higher level, that's the top line right here, compared to when we test with a touch. Right, and, and you all know this, the touch sensation is the last to go. And you can see that the difference on average, the difference between the cold uh, stimulus test um, level and the level determined by touch is about um, two dermatomes. So here, this is about two, three, T3, and this is about T5. So you need to understand um, that you need a different level if you're testing with cold compared if you're testing with touch or sharp. The other thing that makes a difference is what question you ask the patient. So I see a lot of my residents and colleagues saying to the, touching the patient with the stimulus, let's say they touch them with something sharp on the arm, which is not anesthetized. And they say, now tell me when you feel the needle or the pinprick as sharp as it is on your arm. And they start to move the stimulus up the body. Uh, and the patient starts to feel something, but it's not quite sharp yet, right? Um, if you ask the question, when is it the same as on my arm, all right, you will get a higher level than if you ask the question, when does it first feel sharp? Makes complete sense, right? It, it, it feels sharp, although not as sharp as the arm at a lower 
sensory level. Well, which level do we care about? We care about when it first feels sharp. We don't want the patient to feel any pain. So instead of saying to the patient, when is it the same sharpness as on your arm? You should say to the patient, when do you feel sharp? When you first feel sharp, tell me when that is. And that is the sensory level. Or if you're using touch, same question. This is a very um, elegant study by Dr. Russell in the UK, where he showed that the best way of guaranteeing that you have a block for a C-section is to use a touch sensation, a touch stimulus, and if you have a T6 level to touch, then the positive predictive value or the, the, um, is very high. It's, it's, it will not fail. Your epidural will not fail. The patient will not have pain if you have a T6 level to touch. So that tells you that if you um, use a different stimulus like cold, you're gonna to have to have a higher level than T6 because we just said that a, cold, a test to cold results in a higher level than a test to um, touch. All right, let's spend the last couple of minutes talking about what we're going to do about failed epidural anesthesia. Well, there's a couple of um, options that are not great. One is IV supplementation. And you know, we really don't wanna give a lot, a lot of IV supplementation to patients. We particularly don't wanna upton their airway reflexes. Remember women, pregnant women are considered to have a full stomach, especially laboring pregnant women. And if we upton their airway reflexes by giving them a lot of IV supplementation, we increase their risk of pulmonary aspiration. Um, I think this is also the group of patients that sue us because, um, at least in the United States, because they have emotional distress uh, and they're not comfortable during their C-section. We could ask our surgeons to infiltrate local anesthesia, at least in the United States. Our surgeons are not good at this because they never do it. Uh, it's an option for an outright emergency, but other than that, I do not uh, recommend either one of the first two options. So we've got three options, uh, four options that I think are viable. We can replace the epidural catheter. We could do a single shot spinal. We could do a combined spinal epidural, or we could induce general anesthesia. What are the advantages to replacing the epidural catheter? Well, we can use any inner space. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily a uh, mid to low lumbar inner space. Disadvantages is that we just probably gave a large dose of uh, local anesthetic into the epidural space, and now we're gonna do the same thing again. Well, we gave a large dose of local anesthetic someplace. It may or may not be in the epidural space because we have failed. Uh, anesthesia, but now we're going to do it all over again, which I think significantly increases the risk of local anesthetic toxicity. We could have technical difficulties because somehow the neuraxial anatomy may be distorted with all that fluid that we put in for our first block that failed. We could uh, initiate single shot spinal anesthesia. The advantage of that is it's a rapid onset. Um, it's a low local anesthetic dose, so we won't have local anesthetic toxicity. Um, and we have a technical endpoint, so we know we're in the right spot, right? We see CSF coming back. The reason I wrote maybe here is that I've had a few of these fail. Um, because I think the fluid that came back through the needle was actually the fluid that we put in there for the failed epidural and was not CSF. Um, so, so this may not be as good an endpoint after a failed epidural as it normally is for a single shot spinal. And again, we may have the disadvantage of distorted anatomy. Um, the epidural catheter may have failed in the first place because of distorted anatomy, or we have distorted the anatomy by injecting a large amount of fluid back there. The real reason why I tend to avoid uh, single shot spinal anesthesia though, is that there is a high incidence of high or total spinal anesthesia. If you initiate spinal anesthesia after a failed epidural, here are a number of observational trials which suggest that there's a fairly significant incidence of high spinal anesthesia um, when it's initiated again after injecting into the epidural space. What are the possible mechanisms for this occurring? Well, one is compression of the dural sac by the epidural fluid. Remember, this is the, the bony canal, the spinal canal is a closed space. And so if we put volume into the epidural space, um, something else has to give, right? And what gives is um, CSF volume. It gets translocated north. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a second. It's also possible that there's leakage of local anesthetic through the dural puncture. So now we put a hole in the dura and we may have local anesthetic someplace in the epidural space from our failed epidural. Uh, and this may increase the risk of high spinal. 
um, there may have been the presence of subclinical anesthesia. So you had failed anesthesia for the epidural, but you might've had some analgesia or some anesthesia. And when you put a full spinal dose on top of that, uh, it may be too much. And then there may be anatomic aberration. This is a, a very nice MRI study from colleagues in Japan. Uh, and you can see here the spinal cord right, and the epidural space surrounding the spinal cord. And when you inject volume into the epidural space, number one, you push the spinal cord anteriorly, all right, but, but uh, importantly, as we discussed before, the, the volume of the CSF and the lumbar epidural space decreases. So here, a five milliliter injection into the epidural space, here's the volume of the CSF before the injection, uh, and uh, after it goes down. Um, it's very much more compelling though, if you look at 15 milliliters, which is the amount that we would normally put in for a C-section, right? If we're gonna put a C-sec, um, do an epidural for a C-section, we usually give 15 to 20 milliliters of local anesthetic. And you can see here, that the volume decreased markedly. So this is probably the likely reason that we have an increased um, risk of high spinal anesthesia if we initiate spinal anesthesia after a failed epidural. You can see that this maximum decrease in CSF occurs at five minutes and it doesn't return to baseline for 30 minutes. Another possibility would be to do a combined spinal epidural anesthesia and this is usually my go-to. Um, advantages, same as the single shot spinal, right? Low, low dose and you see CSF as an endpoint. Uh, and then you can, the other advantage is you can pick a lower dose, a lower spinal dose than you would normally use. And then if it's not enough, then you can top up with the epidural, right? So you have a decreased risk of total spinal or high spinal because you're starting out with a lower dose. The disadvantage, again, is uh, technical failure, uh, again, because I think I've, I've had this happen a, a couple of times where I've tried to do a CSC and I've put the spinal needle through the epidural needle and I don't get any CSF back. There's no dural puncture. And I think this is because, again, when we put fluid in the epidural space, so all that fluid from our initial epidural dose, um, into the epidural space, pushes the dural sac anterior, and now the spinal needle, which is sticking out of the epidural needle, is not, um, is not long enough to puncture the dura. And I, didn't, uh, I won't talk about the option of general anesthesia, but that obviously is the last option and one that we sometimes need to resort to. All right, just a couple of minutes about pain during the cesarean. So let's say you've started the procedure with epidural and now the patient is complaining of pain. Uh, what are you going to do? Um, one trick is what's called repainting the fence. And this is giving 20 to 30% of your initial dose of local anesthetic. So as I said, that's usually between 15 and 20 milliliters. So giving another five milliliters about 20 minutes after your initial dose. And the theory behind this is when you initially put your first layer of paint on the fence, you can still see the, you can still see the wood underneath, right? And when you give your first dose of uh, local anesthetic for your um, C-section, not all of the sodium receptors are occupied. And when you give a second dose on top of the first dose, you occupy more of the sodium receptors and you get a more dense block. So I routinely do this. I, re, I, I give an extra dose about 20 minutes after my first dose. And, and this is usually about the time of the baby's being delivered, uh, which is actually the most stimulating part of the procedure. You could add epidural opioids. We talked about that. Um, you could use systemic uh, analgesia, not optimal, again, because you don't want to make the patient too sleepy. Um, the thing that is most stimulating during the procedure is when the surgeons exteriorize the uterus, uterus to repair it. I don't know if your surgeons do this, but our surgeons do this all the time. It's very stimulating. And sometimes when I don't have a very um, dense block, I will ask the surgeons to repair the uterus uh, in situ, not take it out of the pelvis. And this is less stimulating to the patient. And then again, depending on where you are in the procedure, uh, you can ask the surgeons to provide some extra local anesthesia. This works particularly well when they're on skin uh, or even fascia, and you can um, uh, supplement your um, epidural block. So um, in summary, uh, I recommend that you cite your labor epidural catheter at least four centimeters so it doesn't fall out. 
Replace labor catheters after several incidents of breakthrough pain. If you have a patient who has a high likelihood of having cesarean, uh, consider using CSE to cite your catheter. I always add uh, a lipid-soluble um, opioid. If I'm using lidocaine, I always add epinephrine, and I add bicarb if I'm using a premixed solution of lidocaine with epinephrine. We talked about uh, the test um, uh, to touch, uh, repainting the fence. And my final bit of advice to you is to redose by the clock. If you have a slow surgical procedure for some reason, perhaps it's a redo operation or a very large patient, um, you should not wait for the uh, epidural to start wearing off before you give the next dose. Once it starts to wear off, it's very hard to, to, to um, or it takes a number of minutes to get it uh, back to where you need it to be. So if I'm using lidocaine with epinephrine, I redose at 60 minutes. If I'm using chloropocaine, uh, much earlier at 35 minutes. And if I'm using ropivacaine, uh, I redose at 90 minutes. So um, this is, again, the summary that we just talked about. I don't need to go over this again. Um, epidural analgesia uh, works well most of the time, but we do need to know how to troubleshoot it. So I appreciate your listening to me. Um, and again, if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Here is my email address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. OK, that wraps up for the presentation. Uh, we have nearly 600 participants here. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we'll discuss uh, the question. I saw there are lots of questions for all the speaker in Q&A box. Okay, Krisha, we have. All right. Okay. Uh, I think I noticed actually uh, for Barbara and uh, Darby already answers uh, most of the questions. Uh, I think it is very interesting because all three presentations actually dealing about, I think, challenges that we face when we deal with obstetric cases, right? So I think I will raise, uh, there are some questions here about um, tranexamic acid. I think I will raise these questions for uh, Professor Barbara and uh, Darby, uh, what do you think about the use of tranexamic acid? Because in Indonesia, actually, uh, it is quite popular here in Indonesia. And I've noticed that uh, there are several um, surgeons and anesthesiologists who administer tranexamic acid like prior to the cesarean. Do you think it can reduce the risk of bleeding? Probably Barbara first. Um, yeah, I think somebody um, asked that question in the chat. Um, there were a couple of questions. The first was about just the routine use of tranexamic acid for every cesarean delivery. And there have been a few randomized controlled trials looking at that, and looking at it for every vaginal delivery as well as every cesarean delivery. And... Um, you know, it, it does decrease the amount of blood loss, but not by a considerable amount, by a small amount, by, a, I, I can't remember the data off the top of my head. I wanna say it was something like a hundred cc's, like it wasn't a lot of difference. And it did not change the incidence of hemorrhage. Um, and so at this time, I don't think we can really recommend it. Interestingly, there's a large multi-center trial taking place right now, um, looking at this very question using tranexamic acid um, for cesarean delivery, not for vaginal, but for cesarean delivery. Um, and it's a multi-center trial that's going to have a sufficient N it, it may show us a different answer, but as of right now, it's not really recommended just routinely. Now, a lot of people do use tranexamic acid before like a higher risk for, um, you know, a high, say, say a heightened suspicion of a placenta accreta or something of that nature. There aren't really data to support that, but people do sometimes do it and recommend it. And nobody's really looked at that particular group of people. 
But at this time, I'm not sure we can recommend uh, doing it routinely for every cesarean delivery. Yeah. And right. then I think the other question that was asked had to do with dosing. And the dose that was used in the woman trial and that's recommended is one gram. And that can be repeated once uh, after 30 minutes or later if the patient is still bleeding or bleeds again. Um, there have been some reports of like thrombosis problems, usually with higher doses. So it's not really recommended. I think this particular question writer was describing a patient that seemed to be an extremist. And in that case, you're just going to have to you know, weigh your own risks and benefits. But at this time, we have the data to support the use of one gram, which is repeated one time. So in other words, a total of two grams, if yeah. needed. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, Darby, do you want to add about the use of tranexamic acid, probably in patients with uh, thrombocytopenia? Do you think? Yeah, I have I had one interesting question. I'll have to defer to my colleagues. Somebody asked in the patients with the platelets at 50 or at to 70,000 or below. Yeah, in between. In between. <laughs> right. Does anybody suggest tranexamic acid? And all I could think was I'm not aware of any studies or the, the, the um, mechanism of action certainly would be different. Or, or do have, have you all heard of that, Dr. Scavone or uh, Wong? Nothing. Yeah. So I thought it was an interesting question, but I couldn't contribute much. I don't know of any data on that. And as you said, it's a different mechanism of action. It'd be hard to make that recommendation. All right. And uh, what about the administration of uh, FFP or cryo? Do you think will benefit? Because it's also quite popular here in Indonesia. Uh, especially to prevent bleedings, uh, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you could give a whole one hour lecture on this issue of the development of coagulopathy um, during hemorrhage. Um, so absolutely, patients with obstetric hemorrhage do seem to develop a consumptive coagulopathy that might be out of proportion to the degree of hemorrhage. And it does appear that fibrinogen, a hypofibrinogenemia is a marker of progression to more severe states of hemorrhage. And so, um, you know, if you're in a practice setting that you can assess coagulation parameters, it is recommended that you're, again, getting back to your protocol, that your protocol somehow address early and frequent assessment of coagulation parameters, specifically fibrinogen, and then reacting to that. Now, we used to, um, we used to automatically include one six unit bag of cryoprecipitate with all of our massive transfusion packs. We've recently changed over to using fibrinogen concentrate. So that's just, that's another option if that's available to you. But the question you're asking about like, Frequent assessment and early treatment of fibrinogen, absolutely. Yes. I don't know if Cindy or, or Darby has something else to add to that. Uh, Darby, do you want to add about the use of FFP or cryo? Uh, yeah, I guess I totally agree. If you're looking to replete the fibrinogen, I would go for the cryoprecipitate or the fibrinogen concentrate and not try to catch up with copious um hard to come by FFP units. So the biggest bang for the buck, if you're trying to deal with that consumptive coagulopathy might be to replace the cryoprecipitate and fibrinogen directly rather than if I, with cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate rather than using FFP for that source. Of I would say, yeah, excuse me, Darby. I would say FFP is the wrong thing to use if you're trying to treat hypofibrinogenemia because it will, there's hardly any fibrinogen in it. And so it just dilutes out the fibrinogen that's already in the, um, uh, in the bloodstream. So it actually drives down the fibrinogen level. So I think if you're treating hypofibrinogenemia and most of us use the cutoff of 200,000 or um, uh, I mean, uh, 200, um, or I think you might use different units. So it might be two grams um, in, in, in your units. Um, um, 
treat a fibrinogen level lower that, than that in the setting of active bleeding because presumably it's being consumed. All right. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions um, for Cynthia about the technique. Do you think you have uh, tips or you know special techniques to prevent failed epidural, especially when you do it for labor analgesia? So this could be another whole lecture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, a couple of things. Um, um, some things that I said before. So uh, epidural catheters fail less often for labor when they're placed as part of a CSE technique as opposed to a straight epidural technique. Now realize that most of these studies were done at teaching institutions where most of the labor epidurals are placed by trainees. And so I think um, there is an added element of certainty when you put a spinal needle through the epidural needle and see CSF coming back that the tip of the epidural needle is in the epidural space. Um, and that's probably why the catheters work more often, particularly as trainees. There's in the United States, there was one large randomized control trial done in a private hospital where all of the catheters were put in by private docs, very experienced, no residents. Um, and they did not find a difference between CSC and epidural, although their rate of failure was so low that the, the study was underpowered for that outcome. Um, I think if they looked at enough catheters, they too would find that CSC is, is less than epidural. Um, what other tips do I have? Um, in, in terms of citing the catheter itself, um, um, there's some evidence that if you use a lot of air, you induce air into the epidural space and you get air pockets and you may have patchy anesthesia. Um, so most people, I think, now use saline to uh, cite their um, epidural catheter. Um, the epidural catheters that we're using right now are, as I said, very um, flimsy which is a good thing, uh, decreases the incidence of intravascular um, uh, placement you know, into an epidural vein, decreases the risk of, um, of uh, paresthesias. Um, I don't know if you have them. We have both single orifice catheters where, the cat, where there's a hole at the tip or multi-orifice catheters where there are multiple holes um, placed circumferentially around the outside of the catheter for about 1.5 centimeters. Um, back from the tip of the catheter. Early studies show that there might be a difference. You might get better analgesia with a multi-orifice catheter. Um, the problem is, is that those were all bolus studies. So they were just giving a bolus of anesthetic solution and it spread more when there were multiple holes. If you hook the epidural catheter though up to an infusion pump and you infuse through a multi-orifice catheter, it only comes out the most proximal hole. Uh, and there's a physics equation that explains that, right? But you have to inject under a fair amount of pressure um, to get the, the drug to come out, the solution to come out of all the holes. Uh, and it only comes out of the most um, proximal hole when you have an infusion. So I don't think the use of multi-orifice catheter versus single orifice catheter is all that critical um, if you're using an infusion pump to deliver your local anesthetic. What, I don't what know, do my colleagues have any more tips? Here, I was, yeah. uh, I was uh, just going to jump in yes. and say also those studies have shown, I think, Dr. Wong, that um, there's no difference with the single and multi-orifice end hole design if as long as they're wire reinforced, right? So Yeah, I so think there is one study, you're right, there's one study from Boston that shows that, that there's no difference between the two. Um, and the other thing with a multi-orifice catheter, it's possible to have holes in two different places, so you in two different spaces. So you could have one hole subdural and one hole epidural. Uh, it's not uh, um, uh, a large incidence, but it's possible. Cynthia, uh, I want to ask you, uh, do you have any experience uh, in the scoliosis patient? Scoliosis. I'm sorry, say it again. Scoliotic. Scoliosis. scoliosis. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's interesting with scoliosis. I would, wish I had a picture to show you. Um, uh, use an ultrasound if you have one. Um, but um, you, when you um, insert the epidural needle, you actually have to go away from the midline. 
uh, and it's counterintuitive, but the spine, uh, what's rotated is the vertebral body and the vertebra, and it sort of drags the spine along with it. So the spinous process is closest to the midline and the vertebral body is furthest away from the midline. And so when you're starting at the, at the spinous process, you have to head toward the vertebral body, which is even more lateral um, than the midline. It's counterintuitive to a lot of people. Um, I usually try to find the spinous process and, um, and follow the, the curve. I don't do a paramedian approach, but of course, that is one thing that could be done. Um, you could do a paramedian approach uh, knowing that you're on the, um, um, again, not in the midline, but you have to still try to think where the midline is because you want to end up in the midline, right? So even a, a regular paramedian approach in a patient who doesn't have scoliosis, even though you're starting on the side, you want your epidural needle to end up in the midline. Okay. I find that's uh, easier to do if you um, start in the, in the spinous process with the sinus, spinous process in the first place. What about the doses? Because uh, I saw it uh, very slower onset. In this I think it's less predictable. predictable. Um, I think it's less predictable. I don't think it's necessarily slower. Um, we did a couple of observational trials when I was at Northwestern, one in patients who had repaired scoliosis with hardware in their back and one in patients who had just laminectomies. In the scoliosis study, um, they, it almost always worked, um, but it was technically more difficult to do. It took longer. Um, the attending anesthesiologist had to take over from the resident uh, uh, more often, um, and they more often had to go to a second level. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is, I want to I was going to add one thing to your tips. I agree with you um, that a combined spinal epidural or CSE can decrease the uh, risk of failure, but what's called a dural puncture epidural or a DPE which also involves making a small hole in the dura, but not necessarily putting the medications in, just the presence of the hole may decrease the incidence of unilateral blocks and sacral sparing and may decrease the incidence of failure the same way doing a CSE does. So if, so if a patient is in early labor and you prefer to avoid seeing you know, some of the that's associated with intrathecal effects, you can still gain the advantage of decreasing risk of failure just by, just by making that hole in the dura with no medication being used. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, they still suggest if you're going to do the dural puncture epidural to have some of those benefits using a 25 or a 26 gauge spinal needle. Is that correct? Not a 27. I, my kit currently has a 27 gauge and I understand that that based on all those early studies that that may not have the uptake through the dural rent. You all, is that correct? Um, that, that's a good question. That, that is what the data seem to show. I don't know if I believe it in my heart, but I'm, I'm curious as to what Dr. Wan thinks. Well, the problem is, is that they've never been, to my knowledge, um, they've never been compared up front, right? So, so there's a study with 27 that says DPE doesn't work. And there are a couple of studies with 25 gauge that says DPE works, but no one has ever compared 25 to 27. Oh. Um, so um, that's the question. <laughs> it's a study waiting to get done. All right. Um, I think we have a few questions about, I think this is for Derby actually. Um, what about the examinations or laboratory tests that you, you routinely perform? Like if you have thrombocytopenic patients, uh, especially about TEG, we, I think I've seen several questions about TEG. Do you think you should routinely do TEG? Yeah, I'm going to, um, we don't routinely use it, so I'm going to defer to my colleagues. I do know that in the consensus statement, we found conflicting evidence about the utility in the setting of thrombocytopenia 
I know a lot of places are, are, are using uh, TEG and Rotem and, and their algorithms are being created to associate the findings with the, with the platelets and the various deficits. Um, but uh, at least in the consensus statement, we said that the evidence was um, still lacking to, uh, in, to encourage the routine use of additional studies like TEG and ROTEM and PT and PTT. What do you all think? I think Barbara uh, can answer. Um, specifically for the question at hand regarding thrombocytopenia, I, I agree with you that there really isn't data to support it. Um, there, there actually is some data that those bedside or at least quicker to result tests can be useful um, during resuscitation from hemorrhage. All right. Um, so you do, you do the not necessarily thrombocytopenia. All right. All right. But when the um, massive hemorrhage occur, do you, what kind of exam um, do you routinely check for um, thrombotic tech or time of I'm, I'm afraid my internet has become unstable, so I'm not All right. question. I'm sorry. I, everyone's going in and out a little bit. All right. All right. All right. Um, okay. So I think we can move. Um, Dr. Rafidia, do you want to add some questions while yeah. I'm looking? Uh, Cynthia, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, maybe some surgeon uh, feel... Uh, the muscle, the abdomen does not relax enough uh, in uh, in epidural anesthesia for C-section. Um, so you definitely do not get as dense a block with an epidural as you do with the spinal. Um, I would say that my surgeons usually don't complain that the abdomen's not relaxed. Um, delivered a baby, so there's usually ex, ex, you know um, extraneous tissue. The, the, the abdomen is more relaxed um, than not, um, and so I think if that, the sensory level is high enough. Um, there should be enough of a motor block. Um, now, if it's starting to wear off and, and, and there's a lot of, this patient starts to what I call push and the, and the um, intestines come out through the incision, then it will be hard for the surgeon to close. But if you have adequate anesthesia, that's not usually the case. You may have to redose the epidural. Grisha, there is a good question from Dr. Rahen. Oh, already, we already answered that. Okay, he's a big fan of Cynthia. <laughs> he knows from resident name uh, your name, your book. So so many people also do the same thing. Yeah, they they know your book. They learn from that. So thank you for coming this uh, morning. Okay, continue. <laughs> Dr. Cecil, do you want to add anything? Regarding, no, no. Uh, I just want thanks uh, uh, the all three speakers. They are very good of friend of mine, especially uh, Cynthia. He, he came maybe at the first two or three Indonesia meeting a long time ago, before 2010, and then after it Barbara and Darby. So thanks everybody. Hopefully next year will be the offline meeting. I can uh, invite you all. That's. Oh, Chris, Chris, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> All right. So I think let's continue about. I think Prof. Cynthia, uh, there are some questions about the dose that you mentioned. I recognize that you already mentioned twenty to thirty percent, right? But there are some questions here regarding the formula to predict the uh, volume required for uh, adequate uh, epidural block. Especially in Indonesia, we have, uh, you know, smaller mother and, you know, larger mother. Do they have any formula to predict the dose required, especially the volume? 
So with an epidural, you need to be concerned with both the concentration of the drug they're using and the volume of the drug, right? So you can use a highly concentrated drug, but unless you give enough volume, you are not going to get a mid-thoracic block. Or you could use a low concentration drug and you give enough volume and you will get a level up to T6, but it will not be dense enough to do surgery. So importantly, you need both a high concentration and a uh, significant volume. If you're starting from scratch, in other words, no block to start with, which is not something that we usually do because if we're starting from scratch, we usually do a spinal. Um, you probably need at least 20 milliliters of local anesthetic solution combined with a fentanyl or sufentanyl. If you're starting uh, with a labor epidural so that you already have a partial block and some of the sodium receptors are already um, blocked, then um, the doses can be a little bit lower sometimes. So I would start with 15, but sometimes you do need 20 or even more um, milliliters of uh, local anesthetic solution. Can I ask a related question, uh, Mrs. Darby? Um, Dr. Wong, you'd mentioned redosing chloroprocaine at 35 minutes. I don't know if they use chloroprocaine much in Indonesia. I know a lot of places don't have access to it, but do you redose with chloroprocaine or do you redose with lidocaine and then you're able to dribble in fentanyl and opioids? Um, I usually redose with lidocaine, not um, not because I think they need it for, for the duration of surgery, at least I hope it's not going to be that long, but then you have analgesia that lasts into the, uh, into the recovery period, but I redose, right? So if at 35 minutes after, um, using chloroprocaine, and again, you, you'll have to tell me if you have it in Indonesia, we use it for emergency cesarean sections because you get the fastest onset with chloroprocaine. The problem is, is it doesn't last very long. Um, and, um, you know, some surgeons can get a C-section done in 35 minutes. Often they cannot. Um, and in that case, you need to redose with either more chloroprocaine or 2% lidocaine as um, Darby suggested. But you can't wait till it starts to wear off. Cause if you start, if you wait till it starts to wear off, it'll be gone by the time that kicks in again, when you give more. And I'd add with epi and bicarb. My, my redoses are also with epinephrine and bicarbonate. I agree. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think uh, uh, there are some questions still, but unfortunately we have limited time. Uh, mm -hmm. We're already um, queued by Dr. Susila to end the, uh, this session. Um, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all very interesting. Uh, we learned a lot of things from this discussion. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Darby, uh, Prof. Cynthia, and Prof. Barbara for giving your time. I know it's late. It's nearly 10 o'clock in the United States. So thank you so much And Saturday evening. Uh, I hope uh, everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully uh, next year, hopefully next year we can see each other in better condition and offline, of course. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Rafidia, for leading uh, this session as well. So, yeah, I think thank that- Thank you so much. Thank you, you for inviting God. us. No. Bye, everybody. The I pleasure. Think. Thank you. If you Bye -bye. have a time, then you can answer the question in Q&A box. Okay. If you leave it up there, I'll, I'll type in some answers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, thank you, everyone.